Well, good morning again. Hope you all have had a great week, and I hope we get a little more rain today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, We're going to be finishing our series today called Collision. It's been a great series, and uh, I'm super uh, excited about the next one that's fixing to start. So uh, just to give you a heads up, next week we're going to start our summer sermon series over the book of Job. Anybody heard of Job? Guy had it pretty rough, and uh, we're going to be looking into how we can uh, be unwavering in the face of difficulties and circumstances and uh, whatever the world may throw our way. So uh, the title of that message or those messages is Unwavering, and we're excited to see what the Lord is going to do through that. But we're going to finish strong today in 1 Kings chapter 20, verses 11 through 21. The year was 1910. Was anybody there? (laughs) Probably not. 1910 on a farm just outside of Lexington, Kentucky. Something very normal, very natural, something that happens quite often in that part of the world. Took place. A horse was born. A colt. He was born to a Thomas Hayes. He was the breeder. He was the owner. Thomas had been in horse racing for some time. He liked to breed and work with the genetics and try to make faster horses. That was his thing. As soon as this particular horse hit the ground, he decided that he was going to do something a little bit different with this horse. He decided that no matter what happened, he was never going to sell this horse. He was going to raise this horse, train this horse, and race this horse himself, and he was never going to sell him. Now, he did sell him. (laughs) Didn't keep his word on that. Many years later, he sold him, but he raised him. A couple of years went by, and uh, Thomas started to race him. He named him Donnerell. Don't know why he named him Donnerell. I don't know if anybody does. Donnerell wasn't a, a particularly outstanding horse out on the circuit. He wasn't a standout by any stretch of the imagination. He did win a few races, but typically against horses he should have beat. Um, He actually only placed second in the race that qualified him to participate in the Kentucky Derby in 1913. Hayes, his owner, originally said he wasn't going to enter Donnerell in the Kentucky Derby because he knew he had absolutely no chance of winning. The favorite that year was a horse named Ten Point. There was another horse named Foundation, And another horse, a third horse named Yankee Nations, those were the top three. Those were the horses that everybody knew. One of those three was going to win it, probably 10 point, because he was the dominant horse of the day. The odds on favorite to win. Donnerell's jockey, his name was Roscoe Goose. Why his mama named him that, we may never know. But Roscoe Goose was the jockey who had been riding Donnerell, and He really wanted to ride in the Kentucky Derby, what jockey wouldn't want to. So he kept trying to get Hayes to enter Donnerell. Hayes told Roscoe there was no way he was going to enter Donnerell in the race. He didn't want to be embarrassed. He didn't want to lose his money. He didn't want to go through all the trouble and the expense of it all. He told Roscoe to find another mount if he wanted to race. Roscoe was one of the premier jockeys in the day. In fact, his nickname was the Golden Goose. He was a really good rider and a really good jockey. He went out and tried to find another mount for the race, but found that all the other horses that had been entered already had jockeys. So he went back to Hayes again and began to pester him every day, multiple times a day, to enter Donnerell in the race. Eventually, Hayes agreed. They entered Donnerell in the 1913 Kentucky Derby. Because Donnerell was a long shot at best, He wasn't stabled there at the Kentucky Derby. In fact, he was stabled over three miles away at another park. They didn't have enough stables at that time for all the horses uh, to be there. And so the horses that had no shot of winning, they just kind of put them off to the side. So the morning of the race, Roscoe, Mr. Hayes, and Donnerell woke up, and uh, they walked three miles to the Kentucky Derby through the streets and down the alleys to get there. They arrived after their over three-mile walk together and got ready for the race. And the race started just like everybody had predicted. Ten Point came out and took an early lead. Foundation was in second. Yankee Nations was a close third. Yankee Nation and Foundations were kind of going back and forth between second and third. At one point, 
One of them even took over the lead from 10 point for a very small amount of time until 10 point gained the lead again. Roscoe was on the back of Donna Rail doing his best. They were in the pack, but not in the running. They were pretty far back and just doing their thing, trying to keep up. 10 points and the other two favorites were out in front of everybody else. It was a three horse race and all eyes were on them. As they came around the final turn, Donnerell and Roscoe moved to the outside and started coming on strong. Donnerell and Roscoe Goose crossed the finish line a half horse length ahead of 10 point and everybody else who was behind them. They set a brand new track record that day in 1913. Donnerell's victory was the largest upset in Kentucky Derby history. It's a record that's still held today. When the race started, the odds were 91 to one against him. The biggest spread ever from a winner, 91 to one. If you would have bet $2 on Donnerell in 1913, you would have got $184 back. Not many people made that bet. Why would I tell you that story? Well, I tell you that story because it emphasizes our big idea for today, which is this. On any given day, anyone can win and anyone can lose. On any given day, everyone can win and everyone can lose. Another interesting thing about Donnerell and Roscoe, before the race started, Roscoe was out there with the other jockeys getting ready and all the jockeys made a pact. They agreed that whoever won the race was gonna take the rest of the jockeys out on the town and they were gonna spend 100% of the jockey's purse that night before the sun came up the next morning. They all agreed no matter who won, that was gonna happen. Well, Roscoe Goose and Donnerell won. He took the biggest purse a jockey had ever gotten at the Kentucky Derby and true to his word, they went out on the town and they spent every penny of it before the sun came up the next morning. Like I said, on any given day, everyone can win and everyone can lose. And sometimes you're gonna win and lose on the same day. Everyone can win and everyone can lose. But everybody likes to win, right? I mean, given the choice between winning and losing, which would you rather do? Would you rather win or would you rather lose? Would you rather be a winner or would you rather be a loser? I mean, nobody woke up this morning and said, you know what, by the end of the day, I hope everybody looks at me and sees me as a real big fat loser. Nobody wakes up thinking, man, I, I hope I turn out to be a loser today. Of course we don't think that way. Of course we don't act that way. We, we want to win, and we want to win big, and we want to win often, and we want to win everywhere. I don't know about you, but I want to win in my marriage. I want to win as a parent. I want to win as a disciple. I want to win as a pastor. I want to win as a friend. I want to win in my relationships. Like, like I want to win, I want to win and bring honor and glory to God. I want to look back on my life and I want to see more victories than I do defeats. I want to see more wins than I do losses. And I don't think that's unique to me and I don't think that's a problem. The only real problem is this, winning is hard. <laughs> Anybody figured that one out yet? Winning is hard, and for us spiritually, winning is really hard because we have an enemy, we have an adversary who does not want us to win. In John chapter 10, verse 10, it says this, these are the words of Jesus, he says, a thief comes to still kill and destroy. But I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. See, your adversary, the enemy, he wants to still kill and destroy. He wants you to lose. He doesn't want you to win. First Peter chapter 5 verses 8 and 9 says this, be sober minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. So knowing we have an enemy who wants to keep us from winning, Knowing we have an enemy who wants to keep us from winning in our relationships, and our marriage, with our health, and our spiritual lives, should put us on guard and should put us alert if we want to be winners. The Bible is full of winners and losers. 
If you read through the pages of Scripture, you will find ample examples of both. And you will discover that anyone can win and anyone can lose. I did a study a while back about some of the main characters in the Bible that we would all consider winners. And as I was looking at their lives, I discovered three things that they all had in common. And these are simple things, these are practical things, and these are honestly pretty easy things. And I think they're the three things that separate winners from losers in God's economy. We're going to look at one of those people today. His name is Ahab. If you had to describe Ahab as a winner or a loser, you would describe him as a loser. His life is not marked by and identified by winning. You need to know a few things about Ahab. I realize he's not a character that you're probably real familiar with, like you might be the Apostle Peter or the Apostle Paul. Ahab was the seventh king of the northern kingdom. He was a follower of God, but his faithfulness to the Lord was compromised on many occasions. He wasn't always faithful. We do know that he worshiped God. We do know that he listened to God and the prophets of God, as we will see today. We know that he named his children after God. He gave them spiritual names. For example, his first son was named Yahweh is grasped. That's the translation of his name. His second was Yahweh is exalted. His third was Yahweh is righteous. But his marriage to Jezebel and the ungodly influence she put into his life would ultimately lead to his downfall. You should know this about Ahab. Ahab incited the anger of God more than any of the other kings who came before him. He was not a guy in God's eyes who won on many occasions. He reigned for 22 years. During those years, he had some military success and he had some political success, and he even had some spiritual success. But he had more losses than he did wins. Ultimately, his 22-year reign is marked by spiritual compromise and failure. He displeased the Lord and disobeyed the Lord a lot more than he obeyed him. In fact, just a few verses after the text we're going to study today, this is what it says about Ahab in 1 Kings 20, verse 42 and 43. It says, the prophet said to him, this is what the Lord says, because you release from your hand the man I had set apart for destruction. It will be your life in place of his and your people in place of his people. The king of Israel left for home resentful and angry, and he entered Samaria. Wasn't very happy about God's declaration on that day. All in all, if you look at Ahab's life and add it all up, I think you would say he's a loser. But you know what? He did win occasionally because anyone can win and anyone can lose, which is why we're talking about him. Because you're probably saying, like, why not pick a guy who won? Why not study a guy who won more? Because this is what I want you to see. I want you to see this can happen to any of us. On any given day, any of us can win. And on any given day, any of us can lose. On any given day, every single one of us faces this collision. This collision between victory and defeat. And if we don't realize that that collision is happening in our lives and around our lives, and sometimes even through our lives, we will easily be deceived, we will easily be distracted, and we will easily be defeated. We have to understand everyone can win and everyone can lose. I want you to know that God wants everybody to win. God wants you to win. God wants his children to win. God wants us to win. But we have a part to play in the process. The story we read about Ahab today is a great victory for him and a great victory for his nation because in this instance, he actually follows these three key things that all of the winners, the successful people in the Bible, follow three key things you can follow. First one is this. If you want to win, you've got to ask God. You've got to talk to God. You've got to pray to God. You have to ask God what you should do, where you should go, how you should do it. You should get the counsel of the creator of the universe. Can we agree? If you want to do anything in your life, big or small or somewhere in between, 
why not go to the creator of the universe and ask him what he happens to think about it? That's a great place to start. And as you read through the people of the Bible that we would consider winners, you will see that they do this consistently in their lives. They ask God. And in this case, Ahab actually does it as well. He does it through a prophet. It says in verse 13 of 1 Kings 20, a prophet approached King Ahab of Israel and said, this is what the Lord says. Do you see this whole huge army? Watch, I'm handing it over to you today so that you may know that I am the Lord. Ahab asked, by whom? And the prophet said, this is what the Lord says. By the young men, the provincial leaders, and then he asked, who is to start the battle? And he said, you. If you want to leave a great victory in your life or have a great victory in your life or be able to look back on your life and see that it was filled with victories, you're going to have to talk to God. You're going to have to ask God. But most of the time when we talk to God, we don't really ask God, do we? Most of the time when we talk to God, we tell God. We tell God what we plan to do. We tell God what he ought to do. We tell God what we would do if we were God. We spend most of our time talking to God, telling God, rather than asking God. Instead of saying, God, how should I? Or God, when should I? Or God, what should I? Or God, who should I do this with or without? Instead of coming to God and asking him, most of the time we come to God and tell him what we've already done, and then we ask him to bless it. We tell him he needs to bless what we've already decided we're going to do. There wasn't much asking about it. It's more of a tell. I'm going to, or Lord, make me successful and give me a victory here because I've already started. Here are my plans, Lord. Now it's your job to bless my will and my plans. And at times, God in his mercy and in his grace will do even that for us, but it's far better to ask him first than to come back and have to ask later. This is what we do a lot of times to God, and this is what gets us in trouble a lot of times. Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus wants us to win. Jesus gives us some direction on this principle about asking God. Here's what he says in Matthew 7, 7 through 8. He says, ask. Ask. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. Now, did you notice what Jesus didn't say? (laughs) Jesus didn't say, tell God, and it'll be given to you. Jesus didn't say, inform God of your will and your plans, and he'll give it to you. Jesus didn't say, do what you think is best or what makes you feel the best, and you'll be blessed. No, he says, ask. Ask God. And then he says, for everyone who asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds. Paul said it like this to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 19. says, rejoice always, pray constantly or continually, Give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Don't stifle the Spirit. Always be asking, always be praying, always be in communication with God. If you want to win, you have to have a good, ongoing, constant, consistent relationship with God. You need to talk to God. You need to walk with God. You need to ask God questions, not simply inform Him of your plans. When was the last time you humbly came before the Lord and just asked for something? I mean sincerely, genuinely, ask God for help or advice. Have you asked him to help your marriage? Have you asked him to help you parent your kids? Have you asked him about your career, if you're in the right spot or if you're doing it the right way or if you should go this way or that way? Have you Have you asked him about your finances? Did you even pray about it before you bought it? Did you even pray about it before you signed on the dotted line and took the loan to do whatever it is 
you felt like you needed to do? Did, did you ask? Or did you just do? Are you asking God or are you telling God? There's a big difference between the two. I suspect we all know that. As parents, how many of you are parents? Raise your hand if you're a parent. Let me see. Okay, lots of parents. How many of you would rather your kids come to you and ask you versus come to you and tell you? Ask? Put your hands up if you would rather them ask. Everybody, right? It, that conversation goes much better when they come and ask versus they come and tell, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. Oh, oh, you are, are you? You know how that conversation goes. You probably learned that lesson as a kid yourself when you went to your mom or your dad and you told them something and they said, oh, really? It's different when you ask. We can't win. We're not going to win if we don't ask because most of the time when we don't ask, we end up making the wrong decision. Everyone can win and everyone can lose and it all hinges or starts with at least us asking. The second thing is this, comes right after asking. After you ask God, you need to hear God. You need to actually listen for what God has to say because see, some people will ask God the question and then they won't even stop or pause long enough to hear God give them the answer. They'll think, well, I, I did my part, I asked, so I guess it's all good. No, you need to not just ask, you need to hear. Look at the people in the Bible you would consider winners, people who were successful, and you will see that they would ask God, and then they would listen, and they would wait to hear God. When God gives them the answer, they hear it, and they do it. And here in this situation, even though King Ahab, by and large, is not a winner in life, in this situation, he actually asked, and then he listened. He heard what God had to say. They're in big trouble. They're outnumbered. Militarily, he's not supposed to win on this day. But remember, anyone can win and anyone can lose. He took the time right here to ask, and then he took the time to hear God's answer. Look at it, verse 13. A prophet approached King Ahab of Israel and said, this is what the Lord says, do you see this whole huge army? Watch, I'm handing it over to you today so that you may know that I am the Lord. He heard that. He heard God say, you're going to win today. This battle is yours. Everyone can win, even when you're outnumbered. And then Ahab asked, by whom? How, how is that going to happen, Lord? And the prophet says, this is what the Lord says, by the young men of the provincial leaders. And then he asked, who's to start the battle? And he said, you. And guess what? Ahab does all of that. He heard God and he goes out and executes exactly what he heard. He did more than ask God. He actually listened to God. We have to not just ask the Lord. We have to also listen. We have to listen long enough to hear what the answer is. Ahab didn't just come and ask God the question and then run off and do what he wanted to do. He came and asked God the question, and then he listened for the answer, and he waited for God's direction if you want to have victory, it's not enough just to ask God and check that off your list, like, boom, I did that. You have to actually listen, try to understand what he wants you to do. Everyone can win and everyone can lose. If you want to be a winner, ask God, and if you want to be a winner, listen to God. If you want to lose, then don't ask, or ask and then don't listen, and you will likely lose. Ahab is a great example of both. Paul had a time in his ministry where we see this principle in action. There's actually multiple times. We'll just use one for the sake of time. I love this one because it's so clear. It's in Acts 16, verses 6 through 10. Say amen if you think Paul's a winner. Amen. Yeah, for sure. This guy asks. This guy listens. He's at this pivotal point in his ministry. Things have not been going smoothly for him, and he's trying to figure out why he can't do what he felt like he thought he should do. And it says this in Acts 16, starting in verse 6. They went through the region of Phrygia into Galatia, and they had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they came to Masia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Passing by Masia, they went down to Troas, and during the night, Paul had a vision 
which a Macedonian man was standing and pleading with him, cross over to Macedonia and help us. After he had seen the vision, we immediately made efforts to set out for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Paul and Silas were sensitive to the voice of God. When things weren't going the way they thought, the way they had planned, the way they had anticipated, they didn't just keep trying to drive that square peg into the round hole. I mean, they didn't just give up and quit either, but they they kept themselves in a position where they were sensitive to what God was doing. They're praying, they're listening, they're asking, and then they hear this message through this vision that God had a different purpose, that God wanted them to go a whole different direction, a direction they had never planned to go, a direction they weren't trying to go, but they were sensitive enough to hear it, and so when God said go, they got up and they went, and they experienced victory in their ministry. So many times, church, God tells us no, and we still go. Or God says, go, and we say, no. Right? Like so many times we hear it, we ask and we hear, but we don't actually go and do what God tells us to do. And then we wonder why we get defeated. We wonder why it doesn't work. We wonder why it fails. It's because we're not really listening. We're not really processing what God has to say. When we look at the lives of people like Moses and Jeremiah, Abraham, Joseph, Peter, James, John, Matthew. When we, when we look at the lives of people in the Bible that we would look at and go, man, those guys won more than they lost. You know what we see? We see that they talked to God, they asked God, and then they listened to him. They heard him when he spoke. And then they win. We don't win by default. We win when we apply the principles of victory to our lives. If you want to have victory in your life this week, you need to ask God and you need to hear God. If you want to win in your marriage, ask God and then hear God. If you want to win as a parent, ask and hear. If you want to win at school, ask and hear. If you want to win at work, ask and hear. If you want to win in your career, ask and hear. You've got to ask and you've got to hear. And then there's this third and final one. And honestly, church, if you do the first two and don't do the last one, it won't matter at all because they've all got to work together. So we've got to ask God, we've got to hear God, and then this third one is we've got to obey God. Because on any given day, everyone can win and everyone can lose. If you ask God and if you hear God, but then if you choose to not obey God, don't expect to win. Obedience is an essential ingredient to victory. It's essential in the lives of those who choose to follow God. We cannot win without being obedient. If you don't believe me, I want you to look at one of the most tragic losers in the Bible. Y'all want to see a real loser? Can I show you a real loser in the Bible? It's in Mark chapter 10, verse 17. I don't know his name. But here's what it says about him. It says, as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him, knelt down before him, and asked him. He did it. He asked. He asked God. He asked the Son of God. He said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Is there a more important question? He's asking the Son of God the most important question in life. Jesus responds, why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. He said to him, teacher, I've I've kept all these from my youth, I'm good. Been doing that. Check. Looking at him, verse 21, Jesus loved him. Jesus loved him, he wanted him to win. And Jesus is about to tell him what he needs to do to do that. He loved him. And he said to him, you lack one thing, go sell all you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But he was dismayed at this demand and he went away grieving because he had many possessions. He asked 
And he asked the right question. He asked the best question. And he clearly heard. We know he heard the response. We know he heard exactly what Jesus told him to do. But you know what? He could not do this last one. He could not obey the command. This man could have won on this day, but instead he lost. And it all fell apart here at this key moment, this moment of obedience. I want you to see what King Ahab does over back in 1 Kings verse 20. Look at verse 15. So Ahab mobilized the young men of the provincial leaders. There were 232. After them, he mobilized all the Israelite troops, 7,000. And they marched out at noon. While Ben-Hadad and the 32 kings who were helping him were getting drunk in their quarters. What a contrast here. And again, I'm not saying Ahab should be a, 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 a model for any of us. Except here, because on any given day, anyone can win and anyone can lose. But on this day he asked, on this day he listened, and on this day he obeyed, and guess what? On this day he won. But look at the contrast. Ahab is over here asking, hearing, and obeying, and the other kings with the bigger army are getting drunk in their tents. What a contrast. Ahab mobilized his officers and his men, and he got after it. They obeyed God. They marched at noon. They didn't wait around all day. They didn't wait till tomorrow. They didn't say, you know what, we need to, we need to have a plan. Let's get all the generals together. Let's, let's figure this out. They didn't say, what the we, what's the weather going to do? They, they didn't say, let's have another meeting about it. They didn't say, let's pray on it or let's sleep on it tonight. God had already told them they were going to win. They had heard God say that. God had already told them this is what they needed to do. They'd heard God say that. And so in this particular instance, right here, right now, he got up and he said, let's go do it. They marched at noon. They got after it. They obeyed God. So many Christians and so many churches today are not obeying God. They're just not. They ask God, they hear God, they hear the answer from God, but they never attack. They never go do what they're supposed to do. They never get the idea out of the business meeting. They never get the idea out of the committee. They ask God and they hear God, but they never obey God, or they wait so long that they wait too long, and whatever opportunity God had in front of them is long gone by the time they get around to doing it. Ahab said, God said attack, so let's get everybody ready. We attack at noon. He rallied the troops and they got after it. If we want to have victory in our church or our business or our marriage or our job or our ministry, we got to obey God. We got to ask, we got to listen, and then we got to obey and do what He says. We got to get after it. When God says go, there's no time to waste. Obey and go. Church, it's almost noon. It's time to do what God says to do. If the life of King Ahab teaches us anything at all, it is this. Everyone can win and everyone can lose. Some of you here today probably think you can never win. You probably think life's never going to turn around for you. You're never going to get ahead. Things are never going to go your way. Your circumstances are never going to change. The whole world's against you. You don't have the right deck of cards. You know, all the old sayings. It's never going to happen. Can I remind you again about that horse we talked about, Donnerell? And this man we talked about, Ahab? If they teach us anything at all, it's this. Everyone can win. And everyone can lose. You can win if you ask, listen, and obey God. There's some of you in the room today who've been thinking about God for a long time. Some of you have been thinking about baptism for a long time, or you've been thinking about giving your tithe faithfully for a long time, or you've been thinking about joining this church, being regular here at the church, not just kind of coming every now and then. You've been thinking about like, man, I'm going to get serious about this. You've been thinking about that for a long time. You've just never gotten up and done it. Ask, hear, and obey if you want to have victory. There are some of you who have been thinking about giving your life to Jesus for a long time. Ask, listen, 
and obey. Repent of your sins and give your life to Christ. It's almost noon. It's time to get after it. It's time to do what God says. It's time to stop messing around. If you want to be a winner, you've got to ask God, you've got to listen to God, and you have got to obey God. Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. It's at the name of Jesus that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. There is no other name in all of creation by which men or women can be saved. He's told you, have you heard? He died on the cross for your sins so you could live. He died on the cross so you could be returned into a right relationship with God. Obey, come, repent, believe, and be saved. It is almost noon. It's time to do what the Lord is calling you to do. Let's pray. If you're here this hour or can hear me this hour and have not given your life to Christ, we invite you right there where you are. No raising your hand, no standing up, no coming to the front. Just right there where you are, we invite you to call on the name of the Lord and be saved, to repent of your sins and be saved. If that's you, simply say this with me. Say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up. I know that I have failed. And so I ask now by faith, Lord, that you would bring victory into my life. I repent of my sins. And by faith, I ask that you would forgive me that you would change me, that you would make me new. Lord, I pray that you would restore me to that right relationship, do that work only you can do. Thank you for your grace and for your goodness. Father, as we close today, we, Lord, we appreciate the fact that you want us to win and that you have made everything possible for us to win. And we apologize, Lord, and we humbly bow in repentance for not asking, for not listening, for not obeying and leading ourselves to defeat so many times. Father, I am grateful that on any given day, every single one of us can win. But I am equally terrified that on any given day, any single one of us can lose. So Father, I pray you would keep our minds and our hearts sharp to this truth. Lord, that you would make us aware of the deception of our enemy and the desire that he has to drag us down. And Father, even when we slip and even when we fall and even when we fail, Lord, I pray that we wouldn't stay there because just like anyone can lose, anyone can win, I pray we would come right back to it, asking, listening, and obeying you to find those victories in our life again. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.